Now, let's welcome home the real American icon, the man who should be the next president of the United States of America. campaign won it. He's a state representative now, and he is fantastic, and he will stand up to big government, and that is David Simpson. <laughs> also, it looks like he will be joined this year from uh, this area, another state representative, and uh, things go as they seem, and that is Jonathan Stickland, who won his primary race. So congratulations. It is a real delight to be here and visit with enthusiastic individuals who really are concerned about uh, our future. I, I was asked to uh, talk about uh, uniting the party as well as balancing the budget. And, and that's a challenge in itself. You know, uh, we, we've been working on that for a few years. <laughs> the very first time I got interested in this was, it was only 39 years ago. You know? <laughs> And, and, and my, uh, my enemies, my political enemies, says, yeah, you've been working at the 39 years, but look at it, look at where the deficit is right now. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I was voting on the short end of most of the folks, and maybe that's one of the reasons why we haven't balanced the budget. So, uh, so uniting, uniting is one thing, uniting is very important, but you have to ask the question, what are you going to unite about? If you yeah. unite around uh, no child left behind, if you unite behind expanding the Department of Education, expanding Medicare benefits, if you, if you unite behind the things that cost money, uh, what good is it? So sure, we want to be united, but we have to unite on the right principle. And if you get confused on what the right principle is and what the position should be, why shouldn't we all just unite behind the Constitution. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
little bit of uniting going on. It wasn't even just meant to show the uniting and the compromise and getting together was a Republican issue. But the newspapers, especially in Washington, D.C., explain, uh, explain how wonderful it is. They finally are working together. They got together, Republican leadership and Democrat leadership got together, and they passed this $140 billion export-import bank loan, which is nothing more than corporate welfare. So compromise and getting together to spend more money is what our problem has been. We have to get people together. We have to spend it. get together and agree that uh, we get rid of foreign aid. Where is the same constitution? But there's one place where we have gotten real progress in the Republican Party, as well as building coalitions on the opposition. It's been a consequence of a lot of hard work and effort by thousands of people, many good economists over the last many decades. And that is, we are making great progress in calling to task the Federal Reserve System and how they when it fails to uh, uh, function very well, they're getting awfully close to that. But uh, the auditing thing comes first, and there's a big coalition. Americans agree by 75-80% that the Congress should act responsibly and know exactly what the Fed is doing. This past week or two, the leadership on our side announced that we will have a major vote on auditing the Fed in July this year. Socialism, but total control through regulations and central banking is just as harmful and will bring the economy down. And that is what's happening to us today. It took a long time. We've lost 98% of the value of our currency since 1913 because of the Federal Reserve System. The major crisis that we even talked about back in the 70s coming from the loss of the last vintage of our dollar to gold that it would lead to the economic crisis we have today. And in the last four years, believe me, people are waking up. That is why we're getting attention on the Federal Reserve. We're in the transition. Keynesianism doesn't work. Communism, socialism didn't work. The great Austrian economist Mises predicted as early as 1912 that socialism would fail because it alters the important factor that you don't have a pricing structure. Under Keynesianism and under the system we have today, we don't have a pricing structure, structure for interest rates. So that disrupts the economy. 
So, it, it, and, it, and it encourages the debt. We have a debt crisis, not in the United States, not just in our individual states, but worldwide. Greece is just a bare opening up of what is going to happen in many, many countries, and we're not much better off. We're just in better shape because the people still trust our dollars. But the transition is occurring. Something will have to replace it. That is our job as conservatives and constitutionalists and free market people and people who believe in property rights is we better have an alternative because those who want to use force and power are up there. They're in Washington and they're anxious to go there. This is why the grassroots effort of making sure you send only individuals who honestly believe in something and understand the marketplace because there will be a change. We will not be able to maintain this status quo. This debt cannot be maintained. I am convinced from economic in economic terms that our country has been slipping for more than 10 years economically. No true jobs, jobs going overseas, explosion of debt, devaluation of the currency, and productive jobs going overseas with an explosion of debt which cannot be maintained. So that time is coming. We don't know when it will come, but I do know we have our work cut out for us, but the answers are there. That's the great thing about it. And it's a great answer. It's a freedom answer. It's some money. It's honest money, property rights, and it's individual liberty. And of course, what I put in the mix, and this I think is so important, is we need to address the subject of foreign policy. We cannot be the only Soviet system that brought them to, to their knees. Ironically, it was an overextension into a country called Afghanistan. <laughs> the president that I, the first president I was able to vote for, I, I believe still is, was a very remarkable president. Not perfect for my terms, but very, very good. He was a military man, and that was Eisenhower. Eisenhower was elected. Eisenhower was elected in 1952. Guess what he ran on? Stop the war. I'm going to vote for you. I'm going to end the war. The Democrats have started. And he did. He did eight months before the war ended. The other thing that Eisenhower did is he refused to take the advice of his advisors to use a nuclear weapon against the Chinese. He also went against his advisors who said, send in troops into Vietnam as a military man. He said that would be foolish. Unfortunately, that happened under the next administration. But also, I remember this so clearly, in 1956, when I thought, well, I remember World War II, the Korea War, I knew about the draft, and it seemed to be inevitable, and I was assumed that I would be drafted. Well, in 1956, there was a Suez crisis. And thank goodness, Eisenhower took care of that in a week. He said, I'm not going there. I'm not going to send troops in there. And the world didn't come to an end. The <laughs> world didn't save the lot of lives. economics and balancing the budget are coming together. And 75% of people now say we are going home, uh, home from Afghanistan. But if you are a believer in government, you have to be, you have to not believe in unlimited war. And today, we're in unlimited war. The wars are being planned. We're just waiting for the day that the troops will be there. The bombs continue to fall. We have drone wars going on constantly. We're wondering when we're going into Syria, when we're going into Iran. And this, this, we don't have the money, even if you want to go. You can't do it. We're flat out broke. And then one of these days, I'm not going to loan us money. So this, this is an economic crisis, the American people. We have used that, this uh, less military intervention often as we call it. Eisenhower did it, but also in the year 2000, our candidate argued the case for a humble foreign policy, 
no policing of the world, and no nation building. What's wrong with that foreign policy? I think that's the way we need. of the law change not only by executive orders and some of the court cases, but also what Congress has done. It is established and understood and part of our culture and our law today that accepts the notion that our president can use the military to arrest American citizens. <laughs> arrest American citizens, that would be one thing bad enough using the military. But it also it is understood now by those in charge that they can be held in secret without an attorney. Yeah. In, indefinitely. That is not what America is all about. I'll tell you, it just is, and that has to be challenged. I think a little bit back about Texas history. You know, the uh, Mexican, uh, Mexico got their independence in 1821 from, from Spain. They wrote a pretty darn good constitution in 1824. And uh, by 1832, there was uh, some disruption in Texas, mainly where, near where I live, in a little town called Velasco. And uh, there was a battle in Velasco. Guess what they were fighting over? The military, the Mexican military arrested 17 Texans, including William Travis, in a little town called Anahuac on Galveston Bay. And they were furious, mainly because the military arrested them, and they were denied a civil trial. And they were going to be hauled off to Valle Cruz to be prosecuted. And, they, and, and that was the first fight, really, of the uh, war for independence. So that, and that was the issue that motivated our founders, the British, the, the soldiers came in, invaded their houses, and, 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 and marched in and made arrests. So it's military control of the civilians that funded our revolutions, the Texas Revolution, and it's been legalized in this country, and I would say it's time to remove that and live up to the rule of law, the Fifth Amendment, the rule of law, and the Constitution. by some of the legal advisors to our current president that he has the authority not only to retain individual Americans uh, that he suspects might be bad people, but he also claims that he has the right that if you had a trial as an American citizen and you were found to be innocent, that they can still hold you in secret prison. People will say, his legal advisors, because they go over a uh, kill list. Who's going to get killed without due process of law? It reminds me of what Roosevelt did. Roosevelt, I bet you could guess, was probably not my favorite president. <laughs> <laughs> but Roosevelt, of course, stole the gold from the American people, and you know, and then we, we stole the gold at $20 an ounce. What he did then was uh, they were fixing the price of gold up so that it could inflate. So on a daily basis, uh, Roosevelt, with some of his uh, uh, economic advisors, would sit, to, sit around a table and decide what the price of gold would be. And, uh, but today, I, I thought that was pretty bad. But today, literally, they sit around and they pick a hit list. Some are American citizens that are on this hit list, but people all around the world. Oh, they're bad guys. They're, they're terrorists. They want to kill us. They want to do these things. 
And, uh, and, and they say, well, if we can do it in a school way, all they have to do is have a drone. Shoot them. Nobody, nobody's in danger. But guess what? Using drones to drop bombs and innocent people getting killed, no due process of law, guess what? It makes a lot of enemies for us. I think it's a focus on We have drifted a long way from the idea of due process of law. They've made fun of this process. The administration, when they have been quizzed on this, well, what about the Fifth Amendment? Aren't we supposed to have due process of law? And they said, well, we have due process of law. But we fulfill the obligation to have due process of law because two or three individuals in the White House sit around and they decide whether he's a really bad guy or not. But one thing to try to remember, whether it's here in this country or any place in the world, when you say, that guy is a bad guy, and, and he needs, we need to take care of him, he's still a suspect. He's still a suspect. He's not a terrorist, he's a suspect. So all around the world, we're deciding, just willy-nilly, who, who, the, who, the, who the terrorists are and who the suspects are. And uh, I'll tell you what, it's going to give us more trouble than, than not, uh, than, than, than good. And that's where we are today. So this is the reason that we don't have to think that these ideas are coming from the far left. These ideas are traditional. They're conservative. They're constitutional. And they've been Republican in the past. I would like to say it's time for us to revitalize these ideas of the due process of law and never go to war without a declaration of war. Without a declaration. And you know, this administration, they're really quite bold. I guess you've noticed that. They, they, they come and they testify, and when they're challenged, they say, Well, don't you think uh, you should have a declaration? No, no, we don't need that. Don't you think you should ask Congress? No, we don't need that. Uh, we'll get our watching words, we'll get our declaration, we'll get our authority from the United Nations and from NATO. <laughs> where the authority comes from. But I'll tell you what, we would fight a lot less wars, we'd be a lot more peace, we'd be a lot richer, and I do not believe we would be in any greater danger if we just follow the law. Four years ago, when the economic crisis hit, it sent a lot of signals. As I said, you know, uh, it's the announcement that there will be the elimination of the Keynesian economic theories, and something will have to replace it. It could be totalitarianism, it could be free markets. I'm betting on the free markets and more freedoms because I hear good messages in our country. hundreds of thousands of young people in the last couple of years, many, most of them probably on campuses. Believe me, they are concerned, they're worried, they want their freedom, they don't want debt, they want jobs, and they do not believe that the government can be murdered to them on a platter. They believe it can be found in the cause of liberty and not in the cause of expanding the role of the government. C.S. Lewis, many years ago, gave some advice about we as people, and he talked about a good egg can't remain a good egg forever. A good egg either has to hatch or it will rot. And I was thinking of an analogy, you know, maybe we can make the analogy to what the founders did. They gave us a good egg. I think they gave us a constitutional republic. They gave it this egg, and it has not really hatched. 
The ideas of liberty were well studied. The founders understood it so clearly and built on it. And because they were well informed, biblically as well as philosophically, they were able to write a wonderful document. And they warned us, if we don't remain as free and moral people, the document won't mean anything. So I'm afraid that uh, we're allowing much to be brought in the way. If you look at the last 100 years, we have given up so much of our liberties and we have become so dependent because we became so rich. Because uh, a free society creates very well and that makes people soft on the issue of protecting how you produce wealth. So we were just able to redistribute wealth, reward the lobbyists, reward the politicians, and everybody seemed to think just shifting wealth around and everything was okay. Except now, today everybody knows there's no wealth there. It's only only made up of debt. So I, I think the, uh, the whole system has, has rotted away, uh, and I would like to see this egg hatch. One thing the founders warned us against uh, was uh, pure democracy. They said pure democracy is very, very bad. Uh, and, you know, we're supposed to be the Republic, you know, the Republican Party, you know. <laughs> so what happens is uh, when the majority becomes dictator, they can rule over the minority. And now, basically, 51% or 52% of the American people are living off the 49% of the producers, and it's only consumption. And this is, this is very, very dangerous. So uh, we, we have to, once again, think about the principles of liberty in order to really hatch it and grow on this. Uh, there, was, there were challenges immediately after the Constitutional Convention. They started nibbling away at the principles laid out. And I think our last hundred years has not been good. But I think the growth of the, of the freedom movement in the last five to 10 years has been fantastic. Five, last five years. Marvelous, and the young people are, 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 you know, attracted to it. So I would say things are going very well uh, in, in that regard. So what we need to do is make sure this is encouraged, and make sure that the people know about it and understand it and know what to respond to. Because the type of government we get, it's it's really what the people allow to happen. You know, it's easy for us, as I do so often, condemn the executive branch, the courts, and the Congress, it's all their fault. No, it's all our faults, because we're responsible for the people up there. Yeah. You know, frequently I use, uh, Use the quote uh, from Samuel Adams about an irate powerless minority uh, will, you know, bring about changes and they're more important than the majority. But it's a mixture too. Yeah, ideas have consequences. They estimate that four or five percent of the uh, of, of the people who who uh, led our revolution knew it and understood it. And uh, the majority, you know, did this back and forth. And fortunately, the leaders, the ones that had the red ideas, we, they won out. But you eventually, ideas have the consequences. And I think the minority very, very powerful. But you know what? You still have to sell it to the people. Because it is the people that will make the decision that, they, that there will be an endorsement. So I think there's an irate minority, tireless minority, fighting and joining the cause of liberty, and that's what's coming. Yeah. 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 On some issues, on some issues, we are winning, and we can win. We still have that freedom to bring about the changes. These changes are correct. I mentioned the fellows there. This is this is way beyond what I ever dreamed could happen. Because I was there for a good many years, and nobody was paying any attention. So I thought, that's the way it would be forever. But no, the, the conditions in the country are coming about, and it's the fruition of those who academically have provided so much information for it. And the same thing is occurring with these endless wars. You know, I'm surprised. Why do why we put up for a war? A long war in our history, 10 years longer. You know, when, when Eisenhower, when the country got irate over the Korean War, it was only two years. War started in 50 by 52. He ran his whole election on, this war is stupid. What are we doing this for? So, and, and, but here we are. Ten years, how long are we going to do it? How long is it going to continue? 
And uh, I think it's, uh, it's way too much internationalism. I like internationalism as voluntary, voluntary trade, travel, freedom of movement, and all that. But I do not like the idea. I am not, I'm not much uh, enamored by the internationalism of the United Nations and NATO and World Trade Organizations and all these things. That's all government internationalism. That will not solve our problem. That's more governments than we need, of course. That's not Discouraging that we fight these battles, we try to win votes, we lose the votes, and, and it just seems so futile. Uh, people say, "Well, I have my father's when he doesn't listen to me." And, and, you know, you hear the stories over and over. It reminds me of a story of a conversation that occurred shortly after the Vietnam uh, War was over. Our, uh, we had a Colonel Colonel uh, Summers who got together with Colonel Tu, uh, representing uh, Vietnam, and the discussion was, just "How do we, you know?" just put this all behind us and we're just sort of uh, cleaning up the mess and, and us getting out of there totally and completely. And uh, our colonel was still pretty bold. He said, you yeah, know, and he was, you know, wanted to get some reassurance. So he says to Colonel too, he says, you know, he says, one thing is, you never once beat us on the battlefield. And uh, two stood there for a minute and thought about it. He says, Colonel, he says, you're exactly right, but it's also irrelevant. It's irrelevant if you can win or lose one battle, but you've got to win the war. So our freedom movement might not be winning all these battles, but we're going to win the war. job and maybe have a better protection of individuality. Yeah. So we can improve on this. We don't have to invent it. And it isn't like that we have to say America is a mess and, and, and that's all their fault. We can pick up the good parts of America, the good parts of markets and property rights and contracts and, and you know limited government. This this is what we, we can do. It's available to us. It will not be nearly as difficult for our shift toward liberty as it would be, say, in a country like Russia, because they didn't have our tradition, and they still have a lot of problems. But we have to get people confident that freedom really is the issue, and understand how it works, because we have been taught for so long, freedom is okay, but don't carry it too far. Well, I would say freedom is freedom. Freedom comes from the fact that you are an individual, you get your life and your liberty from your creator, and the government should protect it and not take it away. We are frequently criticized, uh, you know, the economic policies and the foreign policy. That we're going back to the old days of isolationism and the old days of the gold standard. But let me tell you, big government is very, very old. And big government and inflation and destruction of currency, that is ancient and based on ideas that are wrong. Those who criticize us who want a lot less government, they are the past. We are the future. Yeah. We must maintain a sense of curiosity. Not just that we 
want a better life and we want to be left alone and we want peace, but we have to be curious enough to know exactly the plain truth of economics and foreign policy. We're in a unique group. Most people do not come to political rallies. Believe me, they go at the last minute and they look up and say, what do you vote for today? So if you come to a place like this, you're in this small minority. So your responsibility is much greater. But the responsibility is also to understand the issues and not casually accept, oh, well, yes, the government says I have to do this, and the Federal Reserve System, well, they're wonderful. They always take a good care of us, and, you know, and we also have to have a welfare system because we don't want anybody falling through the cracks. And also, uh, well, you guys who want freedom, you're not humanitarian, you don't care about your fellow man. Well, guess what? You can't be a humanitarian without me for the free market because every other one destroys people's wealth and causes the poverty and unemployment. A lot of people will criticize and say, well, you still want too much of You want people to make all their decisions for themselves? Yeah, I do. <laughs> that we have intellectual freedom. We're allowed to read books, even books about communism, very, very destructive philosophies. We don't burn the books and take them off the shelf, but we have religious freedom, and we're pretty good at religious freedom. Sometimes we see some, uh, some things that aren't uh, perfect, but basically, we're allowed to pick our religion, we're allowed to pick no religion, and religion, can you imagine how many dangerous things have happened over the history of the world in the name of religion? But we don't say you can't have religion because there's a risk to it. And then you say, well, if you legalize all this freedom of choice, even on social matters, your own personal choice, I don't want to run your life the way you eat. You know, in, in a free society, you will always be able to buy a big drink with a lot of sugar in it. <laughs> It should be in a free society. It should be by uh, by the individual. But the one reason why there's a hesitation on the left about economic freedom is they'll say, "Well, there'll be stupid people out there, and they won't save their money, and they won't take care of themselves, and on and on." And others say, "Well, if we allow people to put it in their bodies whatever they want, they're going to make a lot of mistakes." You know what? It, what it happens is, even if people convince it's better, it's it's this lack of tolerance. It's like if I endorse your freedom to do whatever you want, religious wise or economically or whatever, uh, that I endorse what you do, and that is not the case because you have religious freedom. I don't endorse your religious belief. I endorse your right to do what you want. Yeah. you understand why there will be more peace, there will be more prosperity, there will, there will be uh, more tolerance. 
Now, once again, how do we unify people? How do we bring people together? That is the message. That is the message that brings us together. Because we don't have to ask you what you're going to do with your freedom. You might want to use your freedom for one thing, you for something else, but you come together and say, as long as you allow me to do my thing and spend my money, and I can share my responsibility, we should all fight for the same thing, and that is our friend, we all should be in the back. Yeah! So we do them in very, very important times, very interesting times, but I'm very much optimistic on what's happening intellectually. Tell you what, when I come to a group like this, people like you, conservatives, and want to government and let's go believe in the Constitution, this helps me a whole lot. But when I go to Washington, <laughs> I, have, I have trouble. <laughs> This week, I just want to mention to you. I want to see see how you respond because you might disagree with me on this. Because uh, you know we had we had con uh, presidential conventions going on, and since uh, 1976, first first really only uh, national convention that I was a delegate. I was a delegate for uh, Ronald Reagan in 1976, where that was the last time. And that was the last time we actually had a convention that was designed to pick the candidate. <laughs> but, but since that time, Republicans and Democrats, they're, they're not that purpose. They're just shows. And guess who's paying for it? You pay for the Democrats, and the Democrats pay for the Republicans, but most people aren't either Republican or Democrat, but the large majority are independents, and they have to pay. Guess how much they spent over the last, uh, since 76? It's $220 million to do all that stuff that is mainstreaming in all this free advertising. So I postponed for the bill that said, no more, no more tax money for convention. Today, we uh, face the economic crisis. I think every bit as serious as the economic crisis. As a matter of fact, I put it a little bit higher than the economic crisis is the attack on our civil liberties, our personal liberties. The mention, the mention of uh, how, how we can be arrested and, and these assumptions made, uh, I think this is a very, very serious shift. And the way it comes about, I mean, the fact that executive orders, you know, uh, if I had ever had a chance to be the president and I could use executive orders, the only executive orders I would ever do is write an executive order that can't block the executive order. <laughs> writing law or interfering in state laws. Guess what? We would never have Roe versus Wade. We would have had a Texas law that wouldn't have been revealed by the Supreme Court. Yeah. So it is, uh, it is under <laughs> uh, I, I strongly support the position that uh, we could uh, settle uh, a lot of problems. It wouldn't be perfect. And that is repeal Roe versus Wade. I'll tell you how to do it. I have a bill in that by majority vote of Congress and the signature by the President says that the jurisdiction of that issue is removed from the federal courts and then the states will not have this. And 
And if you think of all the laws of executive branch rights, not only the executive, but the signing statements. Well, I like this part, but I don't like this part. I'm going to sign this. That's a, they, they take it upon themselves that they have a line, line item veto. But what about regulations? Are regulations equivalent to laws? Absolutely. They're worse because nobody knows where they are or what they say, and, and you're always tried in a, in, in a, in a court outside the regular court system. You're guilty until proven innocent. Thousands and thousands of pages. When are we going to wake up and say enough is enough? On January 1st of this year, the American people suffered the onslaught of 40,000 new laws. That's, that's too many. I had to get rid of 40,000. <laughs> this week with, uh, with the election in Wisconsin. Yeah. A difficult task, politically unpopular, and up till now it's a, been a political disaster to take on uh, uh, unions, uh, in, in government unions, but uh, Walker took it on, yeah. and he came out with more votes this time than he did. We need more votes this victory was very good and uh, it will help. It's not going to solve the problem. It's going to help other states. States have more obligations. If Texas has been a better state and we've, we've done a lot better because some of our rules are stricter, didn't suffer as much in the recession and all. But the uh, the fact that you take a state like California and others that have just gone overboard on, on these promises, there will be more states seeing them out to them. But, they, they don't have a printing press, so they have more pressure. In Washington, it's different, because when the politicians know that they continue to spend, and they don't have to face up to their constituents and say, well, no, I can't vote for this and this and this, and I'm not going to vote anything on the military, and they go on and on, they keep voting it. Guess why they can get away with that? Because they can always go to the lender of last resort, and that is the Federal Reserve System. looking for solutions economically and you want a different foreign policy and you want to bring things under control, we do have to study the, the issue of, of money. Because the, it's, it's very bad constitutional law because gold and silver is still legal tender under the Constitution. Morally, it's equivalent to counterfeit, so there it, it, it's, it's a moral breakdown. <laughs> economically, it's a disaster because it is the cause of the business cycle. Booms and busts until eventually you get a real big bust, and we're in the middle of this big bust, which I believe has actually been going on for the last 12 years, since the year 2000. But this, this other notion, which is less talked about, is the fact that it facilitates big government. The politicians don't have to act responsibly. The people don't have to act responsibly. Or do we get do we knocks on doors in Washington and say, hey, you know, I think we're in trouble, so well, I think what you should do is cut what I'm getting next year by 10%. Never! You never get that. But the facilitating of this by saying that if you have these treasury bills and the market doesn't want to buy them, and the Fed buys them, not only do they keep interest rates relatively low, we have negative interest rates right now. Gross distortion, and guess what it's doing? Building up debt and not stimulating the economy. But guess who got bailed out? All the guys ripping us off for 12, 15 years through this financial bubble in the housing market, they're the ones who got bailed out. What happened to the average guy, the middle class? They suffer the consequences. They lost their jobs and they're losing their houses. So this whole notion that the um, that the, the welfare system will take care of the poor is an absolute lie. It takes care of the rich. We're getting close to that day, and uh, we should be ready for it. And that should be. You know the obligation of the party that uh, voices uh, good sentiments for fiscal conservatism and uh, bringing people together. 
my ideas of bringing people together is you bring people together for the wrong ideas. What good is it? You have to do the wrong ideas. Correctly, especially a lot of the next generation, uh, believe me, they're studying, they're reading, they know the, the free market economists, they understand the principles, they know the system isn't working, they're sick and tired of the wars, they want their personal liberties, and they like. So I'm optimistic, and I'm not going to get